So this project started back in, uh, in 2015 and I received a phone call from, from Miras and they said, would you like to come in and, and talk to us about, about this unique project they have? And uh, I went along to a meeting and they presented this very wonderful um, elliptical wild shape of a building. And of course that was the start of, of a number of months and years of, of design for, for Bureau Happold. Um, but, but actually the story starts for everybody and, and for today's conversation of, of the, the complication and the challenges of the building. The day that our architect Sean Killer of Killer Design um, sat in a, in a quiet room one day and came up with that wonderful shape which uh, won him the competition and, and then the appointment of the project. And of course the, the moment he, that he did that and the moment that uh, the client, the Prime Minister's office, selected that, that building shape, it began a, a, a sequence of events um, triggering the need for the design team to respond to all those challenges that come with the, the complication um, of, of building that shape and making what we say, making the client's vision viable, making the engineering such that we can achieve building uh, what you see out on site today. Well, we all had a lot of fun looking at, the, at that wonderful shape and, and immediately just throwing around some some equally wild ideas about how to come up with, um, I guess, all the key package point solutions. So, so structures, MEP and facades are always the, the three core disciplines that, that, that feature so heavily on the building, given, given, the, given the shape. Um, starting with the, the need for the, of course, the structural solution. I guess at the moment that has the, the stage, the public stage, because everybody can see it on site. Uh, the, the, the coming up with a diagrid as the real clever solution of how to form that shape and respond to all of the design challenges and all the client brief requirements. The piece of work for Bureau Happard on, on engineering that diagrid has been, has been dominant throughout the number of years that we carried out the design. When we, when we look at that shape um, and we're trying to come up with an idea of how to provide structural support to it, um, in the very early stages, we would just take the, the, the surface model, if you like, and, and run it in an analysis environment and see what the, how the shape responds in terms of the loads that are imposed on it. It's, a, it's, it's an obvious analogy of, of the, the structural form of an egg. So we're dealing with, a, um, in the very early days, with a, just a, a pure shell structure. And, and from that, we can see how the forces move and flow around the surface of the shell and how the, the sort of unusual asymmetric shape responds, how the opening squashes and all of the um, stress peaks and behaviours that we observe from doing that. Now once we have an understanding of that, of course we want to think about actually what will the structural form be. Could it be a shell? We, we explored in, in early days of perhaps using a, a concrete shell to mimic that, that early um, structural um, assimilation. Concrete shell, very difficult to do, so we then um, quickly discount that and then move towards a steelwork solution. Now for steelwork to be viable, um, we begin to take away material from that shell structure. So we take away material that isn't working particularly hard on the surface of the shell and lo and behold what you actually begin to move towards is the diagrid shape that you see. So here we then begin to arrive at uh, diagrid solutions, numerous mem structural members um, in the form, in our case, of, of diamonds. Uh, there are of course other forms, you can use triangular or even mm. just square. Uh, and again in the early stages we arrived at a, a rough and ready diagrid. And then the fun and all of the, the good stuff starts because once we have um, an outline concept structural solution of the diagrid that we that we have a good feel is is has a potential to be efficient and buildable so we're thinking already about what uh, what BAM would ultimately have to deal with we then have to explore all of the infinite possibilities of what the diagrid geometry could be now the diagrid if you like could be anything in the two bookend ranges it could be many hundreds of thousands of tiny little members, steelwork members, or the, the exact opposite of that. We could have much longer members which are much bigger. 
we can have um, a whole different range of structural size members. So, so to move that, to move that challenge on, we we after looking at some bookend scenarios and some some rough mock-ups what that diagram should be, we then began an exercise of scripting out um, some analysis algorithms which allow us to explore, um, in a computational sense, many hundreds of variations of the diagrid geometry that you couldn't or ordinarily um, analyze with just a, a manual method. You, you would need too many people and it would take mm -hmm. you too long. It sounds like this would be something suitable for AI to automate the testing of different... I, indeed, and, and, it's, and it's not dissimilar to that. So, so we, we set up a, a computational mo a model w which has some parametric scripting involved in it and, and that from an AI perspective um, from that setup does what it wants to do and will blindly then spit out all the results that we're after. And what that piece of AI work will do is then tell us actually solution number 27 of the many thousands of solutions that it's run um, hits the peak of efficiencies and is closest to the criteria that you've set. So, so for us, we're interested in making members which are um, all of the same size so we could have chosen that we have lots of different size members. So we could have had a thousand millimeter tubes at the base where you have very high forces and, and, very, and skinny small 200 mil members at the top where the forces are less. But we knew early on that there would be efficiencies in not only cost but fabrication for BAM and Eversendai, um, in, in sourcing the material to have a, a, a single tube size. Um, all of the, the logistics of uh, fabrication for Eversendai, connection design, and also fitting the tube sizes um, consistently into the thickness of the facade that we have. So that for us was a, was a critical um, criteria that we want to achieve, to, to have this very unusual shape um, structurally supported by only one single member size. Is there any practical reason to have this shape or is it just to push the limits of human achievement? Yeah, the shape does a, does a number of things really. Um, of course, it, it I guess top of the list, it is that wonderful wow factor landmark um, and providing Dubai yet again with a world first of, of a building which is of the shape. Um, and yet, it fits in the site in, in, the very, in a very particular manner. So the, the shape um, complements what we have, the, the, very, the very futuristic for their time two triangular jet towers. This form is of, is a, is of great contrast to that and, and provides the, the overall site with that continuation of, 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 of bold, dramatic uh, architectural shapes. What building form. technologies are you using in terms of software and uh, how it's applied in the project? There's a lot of scripting, uh, computational work in the background that's, that's been required to just solve some of the problems that have come up. Um, and that's been created outside of the norms of established software that, that we're all buying off the shelf and using. When we use all those pieces of software, putting the results back into the more standard type of software to enable us to produce the digital uh, information to allow it to be drawn, the 2D drawings, if you like, are, are perhaps the traditional end result. Um, and whilst we do have 2D drawings as a byproduct of the modelling, Really, this, this project has practically done away with that, and we're, we're working entirely in a, in a digital environment. So, the BIM piece of the project, and of course BIM is, is almost common language now for, for most projects around the world, but, but, but BIM for this project has, has, has almost been a necessity to allow us to, to even build. I think it wouldn't be possible in its current form. I think arriving at some of the design solutions, um, they would have been different. They would, you, you wouldn't have realized the, the efficiencies in both cost. I mean, all the good stuff, all the classics that are, that are key for any client of cost, uh, risk and time um, are, are addressed to, to a much fuller and comprehensive level of rigor through the use of BIM. Um, than they could have been done otherwise. So trying to think very early on about um, 
design solutions and how that will translate for the for BAM as the contractor to make things more buildable. Um, Again, the diagram has been a good example of that, and um, we haven't yet talked about the facade. That is the other, other primary and, and arguably even a greater challenge than the, the diagrid. So the facade itself, the design solutions of that, um, where we've used uh, a very, very large panel size um, to reduce the overall number of lifts, as you can imagine, to, to clad the building. Um, for this sort of geometry, every single lift you're doing is a different lift. Mm. So we, we have 1,046, by the last count, number of facade panels. 1,046. And each one of those panels is, is entirely unique in terms of geometry. Whilst the, the building is, is symmetrical um, front to back as you, as you look at the model, the calligraphy shapes, uh, the calligraphy are all glazed. Yeah, the, the calligraphy story um, began very early on because it was part of Sean Killer's original uh, original vision that he, he would have calligraphy on the building that would be inspired by a poem um, from His Highness Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, and of course that's an absolutely key architectural aspect of the building. So we, we knew from day one that we were going to we were going to have to address the challenge of of making these glazed shapes follow the calligraphy. So the, the one of the early stories again of the diagrid was that the diagrid, um, we, we made it a particular density so it, it wouldn't obstruct too many of the windows. Now, whilst the diagrid will be read through the glazing and part of the architectural appeal is that during the night time you can see the diagrid and it'll be quite an interesting feature of the look. Of course, with the MEP, we don't want to be seeing ducts and cable trays and everything else passing through the windows. So from that, you can immediately imagine the distribution challenges which all of the MEP has to undergo to dance around all of the calligraphy to move all of the ducting and cable trays and everything else throughout the building. So the, the interaction of the position of the calligraphy, the size of the calligraphy, the design and related position of all the MEP has been um, a huge design undertaking. And, and again, to even enable us to draw it in 3D has been, has been a, a mountain to climb. And again, BIM and some of the drafting tools that enable us to do that have been, have been absolutely critical in achieving it. We've had to work very hard to, to look at the MEP systems, the, of course the, the amount of glazing and the shape of the glazing that's on the building. Uh, so, so a lot of energy modelling where we've had to introduce the calligraphy in, in detail and, and also refine the extent of glazing. So for us the width of the, of the glazing panels, whether the, whether the physical calligraphy script is, 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 is fatter or thinner aesthetically, also directly drives the amount of glazing area we have and then in turn the amount of heat gain that the building sees. We're also looking at other energy systems across, across the building and the, and the wider project. We have a, a photovoltaic farm um, that's de designated for the project um, and all of those components together with the, with the energy efficiency that's been built into the design are allowing us to hit lead platinum. So how do you clean the building? Our stainless steel facade and that stainless steel finish which you'll, you'll, you'll all see in due course is a, is a, um, has a particular sheen level to it that we've, that we've uh, specified and has a dimpled surface and of course we're keen that that always looks pristine. Um, cleaning any building is always a challenge. You'll see of course around town uh, the, the building management units, the BMUs, the cradles, the, the cranes that hang over the side of our, our, our tall buildings around the city um, and either people are working in cradles or hanging off ropes. So um, to do that on this building is of course a, a, a challenge and, and the model behind us actually uh, is, is one of a, a number of models where we've, um, and it's, it's funny because we, all, we often talk about lots of technology. For the BMU we started and we still do putting pins on a foam model of trying to work out uh, where we will have anchor points, belay points for the rope access system. So the building will be cleaned by, by rope access. Um, we could have had some elaborate cradles and deploying crane systems 
um, that we've looked at in the early concept stages, but they, they, they of course rather impact the aesthetic of the building and detract quite a lot of uh, floor area. Roughly speaking, the red pins on the top and the underside delineate the, the, the rail system that we're using. Uh, the blues are the, the primary anchors and the greens are the anchors that we're using for the, for the, uh, the top area which have their own set of aesthetic requirements because here we have a, a viewing deck that, that you, you'll be able to go out and look, and look. So we don't want some very unsightly anchors um, uh, on, on the facade. And of course then all the anchors are fed into the facade design. So we have some very tricky uh, detailing of the facade panels and attachments through to the steelwork. Uh, to support the loads that come from the rope access system. The two key areas of, of fire safety, so, so analysing the, the smoke paths um, and also the, the evacuation scenario. So we, 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 on both those counts we've employed um, our own set of uh, performance based design given the, the unusual um, shape of the building trying to apply standardised codes of practice is of course very difficult. So we've used some analysis modelling for the, the, the CFD modelling of the smoke evacuation, for the smoke extract. We have a very large atrium again which is all unique uh, geometries. And then we've used an in-house system for the, the modelling, the physical modelling, the simulation of people evacuating the building. So we're, we're looking at the next two months to, to close the steelwork and of course um, that's a very critical time for us in terms of the, comp the level of complication of the steelwork. So um, comparatively we, we've, we've, we've joked internally that we've done the easy bit, which of course it's not, but the, the closing of the bridge at the top by virtue of the need to cantilever the two sides and the the sensitivity that the, the, the diagram has to movements and tolerances during that process are much higher than the rest of the, 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 the diagrid. So that closing piece is a lot more complicated um, and hence, hence takes a little bit more time to complete. But we're hoping to see it finished, bring the two ends together um, and have the full torus shape completed over the next two months.